Well, I'll keep on that. Okay, we will get started. Um, welcome everyone to our Brick Court sanctions soiree, which makes it sound rather glamorous. It's really three panel talks, discussion about UK sanctions. Uh, almost exactly five years ago, just up the road at the Savoy Hotel, uh, we hosted an event about what sanctions might look like post-Brexit. Uh, and at that point, the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act had just received royal assent a couple of days before. Uh, and uh, OFSI, the Office for Financial Sanctions Implementation, was just two years old. And since then, to say that the world of sanctions has been busy is an understatement. The government, under enormous pressure since then, drafted all of the post-Brexit sanctions framework uh, which was, I'm sure we'll be told how many regimes, but probably about 100 statutory instruments under enormous time pressure, and then using their drafting at speed skills uh, after President Putin invaded Ukraine. Many of you in this room will know about the speed at which sanctions have been imposed uh, and amended, not to mention a global pandemic in the five years between now and then. So we thought it was a very good time five years later to take stock of where sanctions in the UK have got to. We're going to talk about that subject from the point of view of three different angles. First of all, sanctions and public law, uh, delisting cases, but other aspects of public law and human rights. Secondly, sanctions and commercial law. Uh, and thirdly, sanctions and OFSI, the regulatory enforcement body. Um, I first just wanted really to thank our government speakers in particular. We're, it's a huge privilege uh, that we have two speakers from the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office and one from OFSI. It makes an enormous difference and I'm very aware that those are the people that you're all here to hear from. Also, many thanks to our speakers in chambers. We're very lucky as a chambers to have many experts in the relevant subject areas, public law and human rights, commercial, chancery law, uh, and uh, European and international law. Thanks also to Paul and Pamela for organizing this evening and to the Royal Society of Arts for hosting. A Couple of words about uh, how it's going to run this evening. We're not going to have a break in between panels. I'm told you can all have drinks in this room, so if you haven't got one, please go and grab one. But there will be a reception with uh, food and drink afterwards. We're going to take some questions after each panel uh, probably just for about five, ten minutes. So if you've got questions on this panel, ask them straight after this panel. There is an overflow room downstairs for people who can't fit in this room. Um, if you are in the overflow room and you want to ask a question, please come up to this room because the roaming microphones will only be here. We are recording this, so if you do have to go before the end, there will be a recording available. Uh, and my final thanks are to Lord Sumption for agreeing to chair this panel. We're extremely grateful to him. Uh, Lord Anderson very sadly um, sended his regrets that he, he couldn't come, uh, but told me he was sure that Lord Sumption would add luster to the evening. Um, so over to Lord Sumption for some luster. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Sumption. My, uh, I suppose, my own qualification for being here is that I wrote the majority judgment in the only Supreme Court decision on the subject uh, of sanctions. I've had a lot of trouble with my colleagues on that one. Um, but you haven't come here to listen to me. Let me introduce those who you have come here to listen to. Uh, Ahila Sonaraja uh, is a legal counsellor at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, she has headed up uh, the uh, department sanctions legal team since the start of this year. Uh, Mike Weeple, on my right, uh, is deputy head of the sanctions team uh, in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, legal directorate, which he joined in 2020. And he heads the sanctions legislation uh, and drafting program. 
Uh, Maya Lester uh, and Malcolm Birdling on my left are both members of Brick Court Chambers, specialising uh, in public law in general and sanctions in particular, uh, and they have uh, acted both for and against the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, on this subject. So let me get the ball rolling by asking a question of you, Malcolm. Um, we are here to look at the public law aspects of sanctions. Uh, could I ask you briefly to set out the scene for us? Um, the UK only started imposing sanctions independently of the European Union uh, since Brexit. So can you tell us what the basic features of the UK sanctions regime are? Certainly, thank you very much. And apologies to those of you in the audience for um, whom this is all extremely, perhaps nauseatingly familiar, but I'll keep it brief. Um, the first point to note, um, as Lord Sumption just said, is that the regime is entirely domestic. Um, it's new, it was built from scratch, and it had to be because previously sanctioning had been done at the EU level. Um, so there is an overarching piece of primary legislation which uh, is nicknamed SAMLA, the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act, uh, which gives in turn ministers the power to make regulations um, by way of statutory instrument that set out the individual sanctioning regimes. Now SAMLA provides a very broad list of purposes uh, for which sanctions can be made. The first is um, compliance with a UN or other international obligation. Um, that's compulsory. You don't have a choice if you're a minister. If the UN Security Council has said someone has to be listed, that's it. They, they're listed. Um, but then there are a range of what are called discretionary purposes. Uh, and they include preventing terrorism, promoting international peace and security, and to promote respect for human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and good governance. So a pretty broad set of permissible purposes. Um, and then SAMLA goes on also to provide the types of sanctions that can be imposed. There's a range of them, but the one that we're going to be focusing primarily with on this panel are uh, financial sanctions, um, which generally involve asset freeze measures affecting the provision of funds or economic resources. Again, very broad definition of um, economic resources um, to certain individuals or entities, uh, and they're referred to as designated persons. Um, they also impose restrictions on the use of assets by designated person and, restrict of, and restrictions on receipt and transfer of funds. So there's a range of um, sanctions that can be imposed and the purpose obviously is to hurt those to whom um, they've been imposed because if, if that wasn't their purpose, they wouldn't, they wouldn't achieve anything. Um, the power to designate um, is given to ministers. Um, as I mentioned, the, it's compulsory where the UN Security Council has designated you, um, but in other cases, ministers have a discretion um, as to who to designate as long as the individual falls within the designation criteria set out in the relevant regulations. Um, and to give you an example of how broad the designation criteria can be, um, I'm going to use the example of the Russian um, sanctions regulations. Um, which permit designation of an individual if the Secretary of State has reasonable grounds to suspect, so that's the evidential standard, that an individual is what is called an involved person. Uh, and an involved person is then defined as someone who's undertaking, or has in the past undertaken, um, one of a rather long list of activities. And those include, um, as well as things that you would expect, um, perhaps some things that you might not, because you are an involved person if you are or have in the past been involved in carrying on business uh, in an area of economic or strategic significance to the government of Russia. Uh, and those sectors are in turn defined very broadly as meaning the Russian chemical sector, construction sector, defense sector, electronic sector, energy sector, extractive sector, financial services sector, information, communication, and digital technologies sector, or the transport sector. So if you are or have been involved in those sectors, you're potentially on the hook for sanctions. And if you think that's broad, there's a bit more, because um, if you are associated with um, someone that falls into that um, very broad um, set of criteria, um, which includes um, family members, um, which is defined broadly, again, as including step siblings, st yeah step-siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and grandchildren, um, you're also um, 
an involved person, even though it's not you that's involved, it's someone you're associated with. Um, so that's, that's who potentially can be designated um, as a matter of ministerial discretion. Um, so if you're unfortunate enough to find yourself um, being designated, um, you want to know what you can do about it, you can't race off to court to challenge it straight away, you have to apply for what's called a ministerial review. We'll be hearing a bit more about how that works, I'm sure, shortly. Um, but what you're asking for when, when you're applying for a ministerial review depends on what basis you've been sanctioned. If it's because you're on the UN list, um, what you're asking the Secretary of State to do is please try to get you off that list. Um, if you are um, designated because the minister has decided in their discretion to designate you, you're asking them to take you off the list. Um, then if the Secretary of State isn't persuaded um, by your um, very um, detailed um, representations, um, you can then go to court. Um, there is a bespoke statutory procedure set out in SAMLA. Um, judicial review is ousted, but you have an appeal where the court is meant to apply the principles um, that would apply in an application for judicial review with a few tweaks, one of which is that um, the right to damages is limited to cases where you can demonstrate the Secretary of State acted in bad faith, uh, and even then there is a, a power for the Secretary of State to cap by regulations the, the amount that you're eligible for. Um, so that, at a trot, um, is the regime. So I'll shut up and let you hear from the people you came here to listen to. Well, let's turn that over to uh, Ella. <coughs> In the nature of things, the process of actually designating uh, somebody in accordance with these criteria is something that happens behind closed doors. Uh, and since you sit behind those closed doors, I wonder if you could describe uh, in general terms how the process works within the department um, uh, from the point where you consider a list uh, of potential targets uh, to those who actually end up on the sanctions list uh, supported by uh, some legal justifications and supporting evidence. Thank you. No, of course. Um, so the first thing I'd say is uh, that it. Uh, I think we necessarily sit behind closed doors when There's it comes to, to sanctions. Not at all. Uh, but just to emphasise that point. I mean, of course, when you sanction individuals or entities, you have to be. Uh, you know, you have to have one eye on asset flight. The whole point is to freeze assets. So that that process is absolutely behind closed doors. Although. Uh, there are, uh, as Malcolm has said, uh, ways of challenging a designation once uh, a sanction is actually made. I mean, I'd, I'd probably start off by saying that sanctions is only one of the foreign policy tools in our toolbox when it comes to responding to crises or reacting to international incidents to which we want to express opposition. I, I think that's really important to, to make clear. So it's not that we kind of kind of reach for sanctions immediately, there is a thought process that goes behind thinking through whether sanctions will be impactful in a particular uh, international context. The other thing I should say is that sanctions are not intended to be a punitive measure. I think we realise that there are serious infringements on individuals' rights that are involved in imposing sanctions, but really what they're intended to be is a way of, of kind of, you know, encouraging behavioural change, uh, essentially trying to incentivise uh, states from seizing uh, particular actions. And I think in the context of Russia, uh, it's, you know, I, I think there, are, there have been references to that our sanctions response being unprecedented, being particularly broad. Certainly, we've introduced a new criteria in relation to designation grounds. But I think it's also important to make the point that we think that our overall response has been proportionate to the, uh, the actions by Russia in relation to Ukraine. I mean, what we're talking about is, of course, an illegal invasion, one of the most serious threats to European security since World War II. Uh, you know, 9,000 civilian deaths, 100,000 soldiers have died on the battlefield to date, and we're only just uncovering, uncovering evidence of mass graves, sexual violence, widespread torture. So that, that's the kind of context that we're Responding to the uh, conflict is, is very much ongoing. We're still in the throes of a land war on, on European soil. Um, and the aim of sanctions is, is really, in this context, to impose a significant cost on Russia and to thwart Russia's capacity and capability to continue, uh, to continue the conflict. And I think in legal terms, it's important to, 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 to see this as our overarching sort of aim and, and foreign policy objective particularly when you're looking at issues like weighing up proportionality, for example. Um, 
I think what we do in, in, in terms of thinking through uh, you know, individual sanctions or, or how we might want to introduce sanctions packages is thinking through where sanctions are likely to have the most impact. We often do that in coordination with international partners, so it's no secret that we coordinate very closely with the G7. Uh, you know, we have looked at where, which strategic sectors are closest or is most significant to the Russian economy, and we think, uh, you know, in, directly or indirectly sort of allow for Russian cap capability to, to continue to wage the war. Uh, we look at the Russian military complex, we look at suppliers uh, who, is, who is supplying weaponry, who is supporting uh, military operations, we look at Kremlin influences. Those are the kinds of, kind of wide kind of, uh, kind of, uh, sort of categories that we look at. And then we drill down into individual cases that we think might be impactful. And it's important to note that we're always very, uh, you know, very, very much focused on whether or not as the act requires us to, we, have, we can have reasonable grounds to suspect that an individual or entity actually falls within the designation criteria. Uh, the Synesis judgment, which was recently handed down, was really quite useful on this point. Um, I think it, it, it really confirmed that a reasonable grounds to suspect is not an evidential threshold, it's not a standard of evidence. Uh, it is essentially a state of mind one has to reach in good faith having looked at an array of information. So the information that we look for is, is often open source information such as reports by the UN, NGOs, uh, credible journalistic reporting, but also you know, simply evidence that's clearly out there uh, uh, and, and incredible. Sometimes intelligence, but you know, very rarely, I think we have uh, a really keen eye on the fact that uh, those who are sanctioned need to have access to the evidence on which uh, their, the sanction cases against them have been based. Uh, and of course, lawyers are always uh, in waiting in the wings to review our sanctions cases. Like all of you, we, you know, we rely on legal professional privilege to be able to provide clear and, uh, clear and, and challenging sometimes advice. Uh, but we're, we're behind the assessment of whether or not there, the, a, a particular sanction can be, uh, you know, is, is rationally supports the purposes of a regime uh, that, we're, that we're operating under. And we also consider as a matter of approach whether or not it's arguable that the ECHR applies or not, but as a matter of approach, we always consider whether or not uh, sanctions can be considered proportionate in individual cases. And, and it's probably worth saying that we have a standard way of approaching these issues. We have a, you know, a standard form in which we record our reasoning, both in terms of how we think a case fits within the designation criteria, also in terms of whether or not we think a particular case is proportionate, uh, and we also have a separate uh, form where we actually record the evidence that we've relied on. And both of those documents are available to individuals who have been sanctioned on request, so we always provide those. Um, obviously, ministers have to, have to make a decision on whether to designate, so these issues go up to the ministerial level for a, for a decision. Um, and also, we always notify those designated. We make all sort of reasonable attempts to, to individually notify individuals. But of course, I think the final, the final sort of step is, is that uh, individuals or entities' names are published on the sanctions list. So it's readily available. I think that's... Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, perhaps we can turn to the contentious side. Um, Maya, we are just beginning to see the first... Uh, challenges to the listing process coming before the courts. Uh, I wonder if you could give us a sense of what the public law issues uh, are likely to be in these cases, um, and in particular, how far the uh, outcome in UK cases is liable to differ uh, from those which come before the European court under their regime. Sure. I mean, before the UK regime came in, there were literally hundreds of cases, and there still are, in the European Court in Luxembourg, which was the place you had to go if you were on an EU sanctions list. And so the UK took the opportunity to think what's good and bad about the EU system now that we have a clean slate and can design our own. And I think overall, uh, without making a value judgment, the UK system is generally a lot better than the EU system. What do I mean by that? Well. In the EU, there is really no meaningful administrative process at all. There's no 
substantive engagement from the EU authorities at all if you are corresponding about the substance of a listing. Because there are very tight and inflexible deadlines in the European Court, you anyway can't engage in that process. You've got to get to court within a two-month period. If you win a case in the European Court, invariably almost, your client will be relisted on an EU list. So you get into a very expensive and very lengthy loop of litigation in the European Court, at the end of which uh, you will almost never get an award of damages, and there almost never would you get an urgent hearing or any form of interim relief. There is a procedure for dealing with closed material, but for various technical reasons, it's never been used in this context. Um, as a matter of substance, though, the court does look at the evidence underlying listings. What it doesn't tend to look at at all is the proportionality of listings, other than saying it's all proportionate because it's an important aim and because there are exceptions to asset freezes. And they also don't really look at the legality of the criteria themselves, i.e. the grounds on which you can be listed. Contrast the UK system. So the, these sanctions designation forms that Ahila have referred to and the accompanying evidence packs are really pretty impressive documents. There is detailed reasoning in there about why you've been listed and why the evidence selected by the Foreign Office is said to justify the criteria for listing. There is also a very meaningful administrative stage because you have to go through a ministerial review during which the government will actually expressly consider the arguments that have been made um, by designated people. We'll wait to see whether the courts will grant urgent hearings, interim relief, but there is certainly a detailed procedure for closed material. But um, in terms of you know, public law issues likely to arise, uh, apart from issues of process, which I think are bound to come up, uh, possibly you know, the issue of the damages <coughs> cap, uh, relistings, we'll see whether the courts look at any of this. But I think the key is, how far will the court engage on issues that didn't really come up in the first case, the only case to come to judgment, um, which is really the proportionality of a listing? So how far, uh, and it would be very interesting to, to hear Jonathan's perspective on this, uh, where proportionality is engaged uh, and the government analyzes proportionality in every case, how far will the courts regard it as their role to get into issues like, is this sanctions measure rationally connected with the aim of stopping the war in Ukraine? Could a less intrusive measure have been used in relation to this person, has a fair balance been struck? All the questions that um, Lord Sumption asked in the Bank Mellat case, which is the case he referred to at the beginning. Uh, and secondly, I suppose the second key thing is, as Malcolm said, the criteria for including people on the lists are really extremely broad. You can be included in a sanctions list because you are a family member of someone who used to be involved in the technology sector of the Russian economy. Now, how likely it is that someone in that category would be listed can be debated, but given the breadth of those criteria, how appropriate will the courts regard it for them to get into those issues which you could characterize as foreign policy, executive, national security type decision making? Well, if I can respond to that challenge, uh, I think that the, in the current um, judicial atmosphere, it will be a great deal more difficult to wrong foot the government than it was at the time when Bank Melat was decided. There are a number of reasons for that. One is the spectacularly broad um, uh, uh, range uh, uh, and the very general language uh, in which the regulations in particular have been couched under the 2018 Act. Um, uh, another uh, is that uh, it seems to me that the government has uh, very considerably smartened up its act uh, since uh, Bank Mellat facts were decided. Um, in Bank Mellat, uh, the government's problem, or one of its problems, was that uh, it was rather unsure what basis it had for proceeding. The account which it gave of the reasons when introducing uh, the measures into Parliament uh, under the positive resolution procedure uh, differed significantly from those which it deployed uh, in court, which is never a very good starting point, whereas one's impression is that these matters are much more carefully thought out now. But I think the main factor 
uh, is that there has been a distinct change in the approach of the courts to public law generally, um, signaled by two important decisions of the Supreme Court. One is the first Shamima Begum case, and the other is the Child Poverty Action Group case of July last year, um, uh, in which um, uh, Robert Reed delivering the judgment of the court uh, essentially um, uh, reinforced the points that he had made in his dissenting judgment in, in Bank Mellat uh, by saying that when you have an issue uh, of uh, public policy, uh, which classically proportionality issues are, uh, the courts should take their cue in a democracy uh, from the elected parliament uh, and should respect the responsibility of ministers to parliament uh, for those judgments. Uh, I think that that is likely uh, to have a very strong uh, and on the whole negative effect on the prospects uh, of those who are seeking to challenge their listing under the current legislation. I mean, you have a day-to-day -day engagement with these issues, Malcolm. I don't know whether you would agree with that or wish to uh, add to it. Well, <laughs> um, well, we'll find out soon, I think, is the, is the short answer, because there is um, um, at least one case that I'm aware of, that I'm in, actually, that's going to be testing these issues um, very shortly. Um, but, yes, it's challenging. And I guess the counterpoint is, um, given those very broad criteria, um, what has Parliament actually decided? They've decided to give an awful lot of discretion to the Secretary of State, and to, to that extent, I guess, they've said, well, it's, for, it's all for the Secretary of State. But at the same time, when Parliament um, originally passed the legislation, they mandated that the Secretary of State had to consider that it was appropriate um, by reference to the um, listing, the, the objectives of the legislation to designate someone, and that was removed. So now what Parliament has said to the Secretary of State is, well, you actually don't have to turn your mind to whether it's appropriate by reference to the... Um, aims of the legislation to designate someone. I'm sure the Secretary of State does, as a matter of course, do that. So it would be difficult to see how rationally it um, could be done. But it, it, in terms of identifying what Parliament has actually done, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to, um, <laughs> to say how they've done anything other than give the Minister a blank cheque. And that, I think, augurs in favour of a, a more robust role for the court. I think the courts are very likely uh, to imply something uh, to the effect that it's got to be appropriate. Uh, if you can imagine a situation where the minister comes before the court and says, this is a completely inappropriate decision I've made, uh, but uh, there's nothing you can do about it because we've removed that from the criteria, he would clearly be laughed out. Uh, and I think that that indicates that one way or another we're going to get back to appropriateness as a matter of judicial decision whatever the regulation says. One would hope so, um, but that begs the question of why it was repealed or why Parliament thought that... Uh... Well, among parliamentary draftsmen, hope springs eternal. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Hello, perhaps I can turn back uh, to you. Um, one uh, uh, sometimes criticised feature of the current regime in the UK is the need to seek a... Uh, a ministerial revision before you can take proceedings uh, under the appeal procedure in the Act. Um, that uh, can, particularly when there are a large number of such cases, uh, take a very long time. And I'm told uh, that there can be, it, it can happen, it can, you can be delayed in your access to a court by anything up to a year, possibly even longer by this process. Um, can you uh, explain what the review process entails and perhaps comment uh, on the um, impact that that has on delaying challenges? Of course, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess I'd start by saying that, you know, we view the ministerial review procedure as, as a positive thing. Um, it's, it's a way, you know, that, uh, you know, it's a chance that we have to review the case uh, against an individual ourselves internally. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, it sort of adds to, you know, the, le the legal protections and the amount of due process we're applying uh, in relation to how we apply the Act. 
Um, I think in terms of length of time it takes, uh, there, there is a requirement in uh, the Sanctions Review Procedure Regulations 2018 for us to conduct these ministerial reviews as soon as reasonably practicable. Uh, and I think the way that we see that requirement really depends on the complexity of the case. Some cases uh, we've actually been able to review relatively quickly. Some cases uh, are, are more complex, require more uh, more sort of review of the evidence, require more coordination, and can sometimes take a longer time. But we all, we're always mindful of the fact that we need to conduct these cases uh, as soon as reasonably practicable, uh, as soon as it's direct, reasonably practicable as the legislation requires us to. Um, I think I'd also say that this is a really quite a careful and involved exercise. Um, you know, first of all, we get a request for a review from a sanctioned individual. We have to check to ensure that the paperwork is, 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 is in, in order. We do actually have guidance available online to say to set out exactly what we expect to see when someone requests a ministerial review. Uh, we actually start from first principles, so we sit down, we assess our case for the designation, we review our own evidence, we check to see if there have been any developments since we first reviewed the evidence. We, of course, have to check uh, to see what sort of submissions the sanctioned individual has, has made, uh, consider, consider or not whether or not we think they, they should be factored into the case uh, for designation. Uh, we also need a pretty high degree of coordination internally. So we have discussions between the geographical policy desk who uh, can kind of advise us on the degree to which the sanction still rationally is rationally connected to the overall purposes of the regime. Uh, there's a lot of coordination which sanctions policy colleagues uh, and of course lawyers are very, very much involved in the process. And we also consider from a legal perspective whether or not we think the designation is still proportionate in current terms. So it may well have been proportionate at the time uh, of making the designation, but circumstances might have changed, such as, you know, so that the, uh, the outcome on proportionality may be different uh, and uh, indicate that we should be considering delisting. Uh, and finally, I mean, as, as, as Malcolm said, obviously there is, even if it would be lawful to maintain a designation, there is a degree of discretion involved in, in these decisions. So there is still a process for checking with ministers and policy officials to consider whether or not the ministerial discretion should be exercised in a way that um, indicates that we should maintain a designation. Uh, and finally, of course, there is the fact that there needs to be ministerial decision. So that requires uh, submitting to ministers and ministers actually making a decision on, on whether or not to continue to maintain the designation, sometimes to vary it. We have done that in the context of administrative reviews or to revoke it. So a fairly involved process that can take some time, uh, but we're very much conscious of the need to, to, to kind of get sanctioned individuals' answers. Mike, I wonder if I can ask you uh, this. I mean, quite apart from the appeal process, I would imagine that the department is inundated with um, requests for guidance, information, uh, and so on. Can you uh, tell us how you deal with those and, and whether there is perhaps scope uh, for some more formalized process of, of giving guidance or answering questions uh, from those affected? Sure. I mean, yes, I mean, there are obviously lots of questions. What we say, uh, we are an indebted. We, we, I think, I, when I talk about it here, is the collective of, of government, because a lot of those questions, as you can imagine, will go directly to offices um, or to the Department of Business and Trade, who are sort of the lead uh, for the trade sanctions. And lots, of, and particularly given the growth in the in the Russia regime, um, it's the area of trade sanctions where a lot of the most novel and um, far-reaching sanctions have been developed at pace uh, through the Russia regime. Um, and we are very conscious, I think, in the Foreign Office that a lot of that has been done at pace and that a lot of it is not straightforward. Uh, and we are always conscious of trying to, to do more to be supportive. Obviously, um, as you will, some of you be aware, has recently published additional updates to some of its guidance, particularly dealing with the vexed issue of ownership and control. Um, I know that there is 
further thinking within the Foreign Office and, and the Treasury about how we can perhaps um, do a bit more on that, particularly taking for account, for example, of what was said in Mint's judgment about public officials and so on. Um, so we're very conscious of the need to, to provide that sort of guidance. Um, and the Department of Business and Trade has uh, dedicated advice lines. Um, generally for, uh, for sanctions, there's the Export Support Service, uh, which advises on export control matters and on sanctions, but there's a specific um, dedicated kind of net, uh, online resource and tool uh, and helpline for, for Russia and Belarus sanctions, given how far reaching they are. Um, but we're very conscious that there is a kind of th th thirst for more, and there's a balance that we are trying to strike at this stage, given the novelty of some of these measures, the lack of clear jurisprudence in some of these areas where we you know, we're, we're, we're conscious of, you know, the, the age-old question that government intention and drafting intention and what the words on the page mean, um, you know, has to be balanced in what we say about what we achieved or what we did um, and, and not giving, you know, purported certainty to, to individual parties about their, their actions and their behaviours. Um, but we are always talking internally and talking to business, talking to stakeholders, talking to civil society about where we can support them better with, with information and guidance. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for perhaps two or three questions from the, the audience. So if you could keep the questions uh, as brief and, uh, and pointed as possible, that would help enormously. Any, any questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question to Ahila and Mike. Um, obviously, there's about, I think, 1,500 or more people have been sanctioned um, under, the, under the Russian <coughs> sanctions, including many business people. And um, in relation to a number of those, that's absolutely, of course, totally legitimate. But there are a few business people who have taken steps to distance themselves from the Russian regime, made statements opposing the war, um, resigned or divested or whatever it might be. So, so they're very Western facing. Um, you've described the process of ministerial review. Is there, is there ever any prospect or possibility that, 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 that you would meet with a representative, someone like me or even me possibly, to, to discuss what more that person could do to be delisted? Is that, is that, is that ever going to be possible, do you think? Well, I'll defer to you on that one. I think, I think I'll sort of uh, slightly duck the question, I'm afraid, by saying that, you know, that is a matter of sanctions policy um, that is, you know, under consideration, obviously, and for our sanctions policy colleagues in, in uh, the Foreign Office. I think the one thing we would say is that, obviously, in the, in the context of administrative reviews, is that we can't maintain designations if they are no longer, they no longer met, meet the criteria and they are no longer rationally connected to the purposes of the regime. I mean, that's very clear and those are circumstances in which we would revoke. But there is an element of discretion, as we've already said, um, and really it's for ministers to, to consider how best to exercise that. But I can't go into the mechanics, I'm afraid, of, of how we might meet with individuals or, you know, in particular cases at this stage. Anyone else? Yes. Um, would the Foreign Office ever review a designation of its own volition, or does it always wait for someone to appeal or go through ministerial review? Because as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, the European <coughs> approach is that they, their designations only last for 12 months, and then they will always review them to reintroduce them for another 12 months, whereas I don't know if that's the, the approach of the Foreign Office. I, I can say that we, you know, ministers do have the power to revoke or vary a designation at any time. Uh, so, you know, obviously it's within our power, uh, it, you know, if they're changing circumstances or we think a case merits revisiting, then it's within our power to consider of our own volition to review it uh, and to make a decision, certainly. I mean, I can't, I can't say very much about our policy in, in, in terms of how we'd go about approaching that, but certainly we're not, we have the power to do it. And Has it ever happened? Sorry? Has it ever happened? Um, 
I, I might sort of duck that question, but I, I, uh, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's fair. I, I can say that if there has been a, a very clearly significant development such that we would be concerned about the legality of continuing a designation, we would obviously um, you know, consider whether or not we should be maintaining a designation. I can't say you know, how, whether or not we'd systematically do that, um, but uh, you know, certainly we're very much aware in terms of a current designation caseload that we need to be constantly reviewing and considering whether or not certain designations ought to be revisited. I think we've got time for one more question. Over there. Thank you. You talked a bit about proportionality, and if you take the case of Russia regulations, the public interest seems very high. Can you talk about some of the factors on the indiv designated individual side that you would consider which may be equal to or outweigh the public interest factors when making that analysis? I mean, I, I think, I, I, you know, the generally the ECHR rights that are engaged that we would look at uh, in relation to access to property, uh, Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention, uh, and certainly Article 8, the impacts on private life and family life. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's possibly mostly in relation to the latter, the individual circumstances uh, that we would, we would certainly consider if there been, had been a particularly, you know, serious interference, then we might need to, to consider whether or not it's, it's, it's correct to maintain a designation. Um, I mean, I think it's really difficult to kind of comment in, in the abstract, but we'd certainly, certainly, you know, weigh in, into account if there'd been a, a particularly serious interference uh, on, on those particular rights, in relation to those particular rights. Well, I think we have now um, finished the first panel. We give way to the second one. Thank you. of the evening. My name is Paul Wright uh, and I'm a barrister at uh, Brickcourt Chambers. I'm joined by two of my colleagues from Brickcourt, uh, Fergus Randolph on my left and Fred Hobs Hobson on my right. Uh, they have extensive experience in advising on <coughs> sanctions issues in the commercial context uh, and Fred has also acted one of the leading commercial court cases on, on the impact of US sanctions on payment obligations, uh, which he's going to talk to us about a, a little later. 
Uh, but before Fergus uh, and, uh, and Fred deal with the substance of the points that they're going to, to talk about, I just wanted to give a very brief overview of, of, of um, sanctions in, in the commercial <coughs> context. I think, as most of you will know, there have been a flurry of amendments since February of last year. In fact, there have been 18 amendments to the UK sanctions regulations as a result of which the restrictions have been expanded and the regulations now ex extend into many areas of commercial and business life. So, as, for example, there are now specific provisions uh, dealing with financial services, joint ventures, trust services uh, and professional and business services, which include <coughs> things like accounting, auditing and management consulting. Uh, but thus far, there haven't been any specific restrictions brought into force in relation to legal services, uh, although those such restrictions have been brought in by the European Union, uh, and the government has threatened to bring them in, but thus far hasn't, hasn't, hasn't done so. So the, 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 the territory now covered by sanctions <coughs> in, in, in commercial life is very wide, uh, and the impact, I think, I think it's fair to say, is all the wider and greater for commercial affairs, uh, as, as the provisions don't just extend to the UK, but they extend to the UK's overseas territories and, and Crown dependencies. So they apply in Bermuda, the BVI, Jer Jersey uh, uh, and Guernsey. Now, stepping back and looking at the sort of the, what, what, what comes across my desk most often, I think, I think one can divide advice that commercial lawyers are asked to provide in relation to the effect of sanctions in, into two broad categories. Uh, the first is, can I enter into a transaction without breaching the sanctions regulations? That, that's the first one. And the second, which is really the flip side, is can I get out of this transaction because of the sanctions regulations? Now, obviously, most of the court cases are going to be dealing with the second aspect uh, of the advice. Um, but it may be an oddity of my practice, but I, I can say that the vast majority of my cases have involved advising whether a party can enter into a transaction or, or become involved in a transaction rather than whether it, it can get out of a transaction. Now, giving such advice ca can involve complex analysis of, of the interaction between English domestic law and the sanctions uh, regulations. Uh, for example, recently I, I had to advise a client whether complicated earn-out provisions in a sale and purchase agreement gave rise to, to uh, a, an equitable charge in favour of a company that was arguably controlled by a, a, a designated uh, person. But perhaps the, the issue that <coughs> most often we, we, I think we have to address when we're advising clients about entering into a transaction is the question of ownership and control. Um, and it's, I think it is, I think in my view, it's one that's very difficult to advise upon. Um, the question is obviously whether a company or trust structure, which is not itself designated, is subject to the various sanctions restrictions because it is owned and controlled by a designated person. Now, now what is meant by ownership and control? Uh, in this context? Well, the, the, statu the statutory provisions provide for two alternative ways of, of proving ownership and control. Uh, the first is a reasonably simple one to apply, and that's really that you've, you've, you've got more than 50% of the shares or voting rights in a company, or the right to appoint or remove the majority of, of the board of directors. That, that's, as I say, that's fairly simple to apply. The real problem comes with the, the second uh, condition, which is whether it's reasonable, having regard to all the circumstances, to expect that the designated person would, if he chose to do so, be able, in most cases, or in significant respects, by whatever means, and whether directly or indirectly, to achieve the result that the affairs of the company are conducted in accordance with the designated person's wishes. Now, uh, I know that I'm far from alone in thinking that this second condition is an unsatisfactorily vague criterion that makes it uh, very uh, difficult uh, to advise clients uh, as to whether they can enter into transactions or have dealings uh, with companies 
or, or, or not. Now, uh, Mrs Justice Cockerell has given some guidance in her decision of, of January of this year in the case of National Bank Trust and Mints uh, about what, what this second condition means. Uh, to my mind, I think the jury is still out on whether that guidance is entirely right or, or entirely helpful. But as Fergus is going to deal with this as part, as part of his talk uh, about some of the uh, recent commercial cases, I, I won't say anything more about that now, but I'll just hand over to to Fergus to enlighten us about what the true meaning of uh, uh, ownership and control is. Well, um, thank you, first of all. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm going to um, uh, tell you all uh, about ownership and control and what the true meaning is, because I don't know what the true meaning is. And I don't know whether I'm going to go behind Mrs Justice Cockrell in Mints. Um, but before I get to, I'm going to concentrate on Mints and then uh, another case that was handed down the same day, um, both of which have one takeaway point for me, something to do with the fact, not really to do with what was found. It's the approach taken by the commercial court. And this picks up on what Mai was saying earlier. Before, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come out, I, I, I'm, I wasn't in favour of Brexit, and there are many um, bad things, I think, that happened due to Brexit. However, as Maya has correctly identified, one of the benefits of, uh, of, of, of bringing things home and taking control is that we do have a better system of judicial review and general administrative challenge to these important decisions. And one way is the speed at which uh, the commercial court in particular has been able to identify and determine important issues that go, that cut across that, are, that, that, that can apply in many circumstances, not just the circumstances of that particular age, by way of a Part 8 procedure. Now, they, the, gen, the European Court simply doesn't have that. Um, and a Part 8 procedure, as you will all doubtless know, just, you don't have any issues of, of, of evidence, really, or, or controversial evidence. You don't have cross-examination. You don't have disclosure. You, and a lot of times, you'll have all the parties to the application actually being ad idem as to where they think the law is. But the question is, does the court think that? And we're using the court in that way um, because with great respect to the administrative side of things, we've heard about the delays and the FCDO and OFSI you know, try very hard, they're very busy, they have bulked up in terms of personnel, but nonetheless it can take many months. And when you're talking about a transaction where your asset, for example, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, is degrading from a value perspective day in, day out uh, to your client's detriment. You need a determination very quickly. And I think, I must say, and I'm not sort of waving uh, uh, the British flag for any particular reason, I just think in this area we are uh, becoming and we will stay uh, top of the pile in terms of the manner in which we deal with uh, sanctions. And I think we will become uh, uh, somewhat of a focal point uh, for those that have the slightest link uh, to this jurisdiction, as we have in other uh, international matters. Um, so turning uh, to Mintz, um, Mrs Justice Cockrell heard the Mintz case uh, in mid-December of 2022 and handed down uh, what I would describe uh, as a magisterial uh, judgment, quite lengthy, many, many paragraphs, on the 27th of January. So that's swift. Uh, and helpful um, and essentially uh, I'm sure most of you if not all of you know is determining an application to set, stay substantial commercial litigation that predated the Russian sanctions and predated uh, 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 Brexit and so it led her Mrs Justice Cockrell to in the introductory section I do advise uh, you if you haven't read it, do please read it, because it's, it's useful, not so much at the tail end where you get the business end of the judgment. Yeah, that, that's helpful and, and interesting. But it's really, she, she sets out in a very clear manner the position prior to uh, Brexit, as, as Malcolm uh, told us all about, the position uh, during Brexit, and the position uh, post-Brexit. And in this particular case, the claimants uh, had uh, 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 succeeded in obtaining freezing orders against the defendants. Now, the problem 
for the claimants was that the second claimant became a designated, in Eurospeak it's sanctioned, but because we wanted to be slightly different, you had to call them designated. It doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. So the second claimant was designated by the Secretary of State, and the first claimant was deemed uh, to be uh, pursuant to uh, the provisions that we just heard from Paul in Regulation 7.4, uh, to be owned or controlled by uh, the second claimant, and therefore uh, should be uh, uh, tainted, if you will, or, or should be caught uh, by the sanctions. Now, because of the manner in which Mrs Justice Cockrell came to her decision on the key first point, which is, can you enter a judgment in favour of uh, designated parties as a matter of sanctions law, because she said, essentially, yes, you can, um, the whole issue of ownership and control with regard to the first claimant became uh, less, uh, uh, less important. Um, but just to play herself in and picking up on a point that was raised in the first panel, she, um, she said when looking at the issue of whether judgment could be entered in this context, and looking at, and we heard from the RFCDO colleagues, important issues with regard to proportionality, especially where you're taking away or restricting, temporarily, I'd underline, uh, uh, human rights. And she said this, Parliament can, if it wishes, plainly make inroads into fundamental rights. Where that is unambiguously done, uh, which will generally be expressed, but may in certain circumstances be implicit, the courts will uphold that intent. However, this is the important point, uh, because of the importance of those rights, and we heard Article 1, Protocol 1 will be definitely one of those rights, and right to family life under Article 8 also, their curtailment or deprivation will not be found unless that result is clearly authorised by the relevant primary legislation. So watch this space in terms of maybe the case that uh, Malcolm's doing, and that's a paragraph 75 of the Mint's judgment. Um, and it does raise important issues because we've, I think we've seen for the first time in the US four sales of designated <coughs> uh, persons' assets and the, the proceeds from which have been sent to Ukraine to help with the war effort. Now, they don't have Article 1, Protocol 1 in America, but they have other things. And it's very interesting to see what, well, I can't think that that would happen in this country, uh, particularly in the light of what we heard from our FCDO colleague. And in the light of the Mint's judgment, that might be very complex, because it's hard to see how Parliament could possibly have said that, either, well, it certainly didn't say it expressly, and it's difficult to see how it might have said that impliedly. So the first key issue, <coughs> could judgment be entered for the claimants in the case given their designated uh, status? And essentially, that, as you can readily grasp, goes to access to the court. Do the, do the sanctions regime uh, uh, restrict that, such an access? And then the court, as I said, had a look at the position pre-Brexit, post-Brexit, and interesting enough, one of the problems for the claimants was that there was a, uh, a distinction, a marked distinction, between the EU legislation, which pre-existed the UK legislation, and the UK legislation, and she put it out on the table, which is very nice, and you can read across, and you can see there's a gap, there's a pretty important gap, and so obviously the defence said, well look, there's a gap, um, you must, must read that gap as being, as, as, as essentially uh, allowing us to say that uh, the EU position is different from the UK position, uh, to, and the UK position is therefore different from the UK, EU position, to our benefit. To which she said this, one can perhaps also take as relevant background that the regulations are aimed at taking the UK into a post-Brexit world, is the point that uh, Malcolm made. It's worth bearing in mind that on the defendant's approach, what would be being done would be to take the UK, brackets, a major international legal centre, on any analysis, close brackets, fundamentally out of step with the EU in a way that would make the UK a less competent jurisdiction for dispute resolution than the EU. That's paragraph 95 of the judgment. Well, 
<coughs> it's interesting. Um, Brexit clearly intended uh, uh, for us to take a different position uh, uh, where we wanted to from the EU. That was the whole point. We're taking back control. And we have um, the EU regulations that have been there forever, or at least 2014, and some instances before that. <coughs> and you have the UK uh, drafts people who obviously knew what was written in the EU regulations and decided not to copy out. They didn't do a gold-plating exercise, which we used to do with directives and implementing <coughs> regulations. Uh, they didn't do that at all. They deliberately excluded certain provisions in the EU legislation. Now, you have to ask yourself why. Well, maybe one doesn't, because Mrs Justice Cockrell didn't think that that was a terribly interesting uh, point. Um, and whether the regulations were conceived with uh, 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 taking us on a different uh, trajectory to that of the EU, well, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I would think that it's reasonable to suggest that it, they are, uh, because they are very different. Um, anyway, that did not help the uh, defendants' arguments, and nor did uh, the defendants' arguments. Uh, they relied on Lord Sumption's uh, speech in, uh, in, 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 in Bel Hajj, in enclosed material, amongst other things, uh, where they adventurously read what he said. I'll be interested over drinks maybe to, to discuss this with them. Well, they said, because um, uh, Lord Sumption said, once one uh, has an established, you can have an established derogation from a fundamental right. They said, they construed that as meaning, well, once you've had uh, uh, one exception uh, to a, a, a general uh, 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 principle, uh, you can have derogations from all fundamental rights. And in fact, not only can you have them, you must have them. Derogations from all fundamental rights must be permissible, subject to the question of interpretation. That's paragraph 100. That did not go down well with Mrs. Justice Cockrell, and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't go down with Lord Sumption, but he doesn't have to tell us now. Um, so the court then went on to find, having found that judgment could be entered, that a judgment debt is on its face funds and this is where I personally spend a lot of my time thinking about what is a fund under Section 60 of SAMLA and what is an economic resource. Important difference, because if you're a fund, your dealing uh, permutations are not wider, they're much narrower. In other words, what you can do, which is not permitted, is tiny. Uh, if you have an economic resource, your dealing possibilities are therefore uh, wider. So it is an important distinction. And interesting in that case, Mrs. Justice Cockrell based herself on a judgment of Mr. Justice Jack in the BVI. Now, he has had a pretty important role to play in terms of UK uh, sanctions, jurisprudence, or case law, uh, because essentially the, the UK regulations were ported across by way of statutory instrument to the BVI. And he has sat as one of the judges there, and there have been a lot of cases, surprise, surprise. And he has come out with a number of interesting uh, judgments, one of which was uh, J.S. and Taruta, uh, uh, where essentially he found that a judgment debt was on, certainly on its face, uh, funds. The judge then went on to find that a cause of action, so separate from a judgment debt, obviously, uh, could be construed as an economic uh, resource. But having made those findings, I query whether they're right, but having, because <clears throat> Certainly, the judgment debt was based on a concession by the claimant. Should they have made that concession? Query, it doesn't matter, it's made. But anyway, Mr. Justice Cockrell went on to find that despite the fact the judgment debt is a fund under Section 60 and uh, a cause of action is potentially an economic resource under Section 60, nonetheless, entering judgment on the judgment debt would not be dealing within the meaning of uh, Regulation 11. So that's all right. So anyway, she then comes bouncing on to uh, ownership and control. Now, I understand that David Heaton, who is over there, uh, who's on the third panel, will be discussing this. And I'm, it, it was taken short by Mrs. Justice Cockrell, because she spent quite a lot of her energy and, and short time between the hearing and the judgment date actually setting out all the detail I've gone through. And, the <coughs> and essentially, the key point was that why it was argued that uh, uh, the relevant claimant uh, was uh, uh, 
uh, uh, owned or controlled by the second claimant, that was the first claimant, owned or controlled by the second claimant, was uh, because uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, president of, of, of the Russian Federation, and uh, the governor uh, of, of the Central Bank of Russia, uh, Ms. Elvira Nabuliana, uh, were uh, designated, and they were said to uh, uh, be able to uh, control uh, the, um, the first claimant by virtue of the fact that any recoveries the first claimant would make under the judgment would be paid uh, to the uh, Russian Central Bank, um, which by law then had to transfer 75% of any proceeds it received to the federal budget of the Russian Federation. So you can see roughly where you're coming to, but um, essentially that was not upheld, although I use the word upheld, uh, it, 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 it's not a particularly apposite word, uh, because the court came to, quote unquote, the tentative conclusion that it wasn't reasonable to suggest, pursuant to Regulation 74, that there was an intention uh, to find that Mr. Putin or Ms. Nubiliana would be able to control the first claimant's uh, uh, affairs. And in coming to that view, um, the court, I think, correctly found that 7.4, and we've heard from Paul, the first 7.4a is relatively straightforward. It's all about shareholdings and, and what you can and cannot do. And the next one down is rather more complex, has led to much wider uh, uh, approach to ownership and control with grandchildren and, and various others being in that position. Um, and she said essentially that 74B wasn't all about ownership, it was about control and it was a backstop to essentially catch that would, which would not be caught by ordinary uh, control uh, provisions. The court found it significant that the, neither the Russian Federation nor the Russian Central Bank had been designated, that's paragraph 2338, uh, 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 and there was a suggestion, nothing more, that it would be unfair to be designated by way of a sidewind when those affected would have no notice and would be unable to challenge that sanction under Section 38. And I think we'll pick that up with uh, David. And at the end of the day, quote unquote, there were real world reasons why the issue should be resolved uh, in the claimant's favour. Uh, and... Uh, by reference to something that's pre-existed and w way earlier than, than sanctions and nothing specific to do with sanction, that well-known principle of uh, doubtful penalisation as enunciated by Lord Justice Simon Brown in the Ricketts and Ad Valorem case I I I I in the Court of Appeal. And it said, the court event finally said that it'd been assisted no more by the off-sea guidance. Well, you wouldn't expect any more. Guidance is guidance. It's not binding. Uh, uh, but... Um, it did say, finally, in terms of 7.4, that its preference, again, not a holding, preference, tentative, everything is super tentative in Mints on ownership and control, that their view, or her view, the court's view, was that 7.4 should be construed narrowly in the sense that only political office should fall outside its scope, control through employed office or personal control would fall within its scope. So, and I think that again can be something for, uh, I'm putting a lot on David's plate, I'm sorry about that, but um, uh, 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 we can doubtless discuss that uh, later. Final, very quick uh, 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 point is on the second case, Graver Law. I'm not gonna go I I in into the facts. The same day, actually, that Mrs. Justice, um, uh, Mrs. Justice Cockrell handed down her judgment, Mr. Justice Foxton handed down his judgment, and time does preclude me from going into any detail, but the court acted in a pragmatic fashion, not least because it was following a Court of Appeal decision earlier uh, in the Muir shipping case, where in this case it was a contractual obligation to make the payment under the Charter Party in US dollars. Had they done that, that would be in breach of the relevant US and EU regulations. Uh, the court said, well, they, the, the contractual obligations could be wed, read widely, well, very widely, as it turns out, and that payment in euros uh, would be perfectly uh, satisfactory and would uh, not breach the terms of uh, the uh, charter party. Uh, and so, again, a good example, as is 
This is Justice Cockrell's judgment in Mintz of a pragmatic approach being taken whereby essentially contractual obligations are to be upheld absent express sanctions uh, provisions. And so with that, if I may, I'll pass on to Fred, who can tell us all about his case. Fergus, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be discussing the impact of US <coughs> sanctions on the enforceability of a contract governed by English law. And this situation will arise where you have a payment obligation governed by English law and payment is to be made in US dollars. And the paying party says that if it made payment, that would put it in breach of US sanctions. And the question is, does breach of US sanctions affect the enforceability of the English law governed payment obligation? So one can see at a glance that this will be a fairly typical uh, occurrence in, 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 in the sanctions context where you've got a US dollar payment obligation pursuant to a contract governed by English law. And this is one of the issues that came up in Celestial Aviation and Unicredit, a decision of Deputy Judge Christopher Hancock KC handed down in March of this year, in which I acted for the claimant together with Mark Howard KC. And it involved a dispute under letters of credit in connection with the leasing of aircraft to Russian airlines. And Unicredit was required <coughs> to pay some $46 million under the letters of credit. They were governed by English law, and payment in US dollars was to be made to an account in London. And Unicredit raised a host of sanctions arguments, both under UK and US regimes, to resist paying. And one of them was to say that payment in US dollars would cause it to commit an offence under US law and assuming that was correct as a matter of US law, the question was what, if any, impact did that have uh, in terms of the enforceability of the payment obligation? Now, the only connection to the US in this case was that payment was to be made in US dollars. And because any US dollar funds transfer has to be routed through the New York banking system via a correspondent bank. That, it was said, was sufficient to engage the application of US sanctions. So on that basis, wherever you have a US dollar payment, that will at least arguably act as a hook to engage US sanctions notwithstanding the lack of any other nexus to the United States. Now, the starting point as a matter of English conflict of law analysis is that breach of US <coughs> sanctions, as with any other foreign law, is generally irrelevant to the enforceability of an obligation governed by English law. And in order for illegality under US law to impact a contract governed by English law, two things are needed. First, it has to be the case that performance of the obligation requires a party to do something in the US. There has to be some act that the performing party has to perform within the United States. And second, that act has to be illegal <coughs> as a matter of US law. So the question in the case then became, if a party is paying US dollars to an account in England, does that involve that party doing anything 
in the United States? And that question can be surprisingly nutty to answer as the cases stand. And the cases distinguish between, on the one hand, an act of performance in, say, the US, and on the other hand, doing something in the US which isn't performance per se, but is merely equipping you to perform elsewhere. <laughs> And the leading case on this distinction is the Libyan bank case, uh, a case that uh, Lord, Lord Sumption acted uh, for one of the parties back in 1989. And that case suggests that making a funds transfer from New York to England would involve an act of performance in the US. And so on that basis, if you have to make a US dollar funds transfer, that is an act of performance for the purposes of English conflict of law analysis. And if it's illegal to do that in the US, it would follow that the payment obligation is unenforceable under English law. So that's where the court got to in Celestial but importantly, and luckily for our client, it didn't stop there. Significantly, it went on to ask, would there be some other way <coughs> of making payment which did not involve the paying party having to do anything within the United States? And the court held, picking up on the analysis in the Libyan bank case, that payment could, at least theoretically, be made in cash by delivering US dollars. Um, and this is $46 million, of course, we're talking about. And uh, of course, there are money laundering restrictions and so on. But nevertheless, the court held that theoretically, uh, simply flying over cash in a plane would be a way of discharging that payment obligation. So on that basis, uh, 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 unlikely in the real world as it may seem, the court held that performance of the payment obligation would not necessarily involve uh, an act of performance in the US. Uh, another uh, get out that the court uh, went for was to say that because payment was to be made in England, there's a very technical rule uh, buried away and, and dicey and so on, where e even if E even though the US, e even though the payment obligation is in US dollars, if you're paying that in England, then the paying party has the option to pay in sterling, notwithstanding that the contract specified US dollars. So that buried away and dicey was an important uh, further route that the court adopted to be saying that there would be another way to enact performance without having to actually do anything in the US. And so because the court held there were other means to discharge the payment obligation that didn't involve you doing anything within the US, the court held that Unicredit, the defendant, could not <coughs> escape its payment obligation and it held that the US sanctions defence, along with the other uh, UK-based sanctions defences, all failed. So, as I, as I see it, there are two takeaways uh, from that case uh, in practice. Uh, first, the decision emphasises the difficulty which a party will face in saying that it cannot make payment under an English law governed contract on the basis that to make payment uh, would involve a breach of US sanctions. More often than not, the US law position will be irrelevant to the enforceability of the uh, payment obligation. So whatever US law says, <coughs> content of it doesn't matter. It's a matter of English conflict rules. US law would simply be irrelevant. Uh, and second, 
Uh, it's important to note that the position would plainly be different had there been an express sanctions clause in the contract that excuses a party from performance if it involved or risked um, a breach of US law. So plainly, uh, from, from a drafting viewpoint, that emphasises the very real protection that a sanctions clause can provide in those circumstances. So that's been something of a canter through the conflicts uh, uh, angle to the celestial decision. Um, and with that, Paul, I'll yes, hand that thank to you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, uh, the celestial aviation case um, uh, deals with some other interesting aspects of, of the sanctions legislation. Um, unfortunately, we only, we only have time, I think, to, to address one of them, which is section 44 of SAMLA, which arose in relation to the, the consequentials argument after the main judgment. Would, it, would you briefly explain for our uh, audience of course. How, that, how that arose and, and how the judge resolved the, the issue <coughs> in your case? Uh, of course. No, thanks, Paul. So, um, uh, 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 in the main judgment, the defendant, Unicredit, uh, w it, it was held that it had been liable to make payment under the letters of credit back in March 2022. And payment wasn't made until November, some nine months later. And the question was, was our client, Celestial, entitled to recover interest in the normal way pursuant to Section 35A for that nine-month period? And ordinarily, the answer would be blindingly obvious. Of course it would. It was kept out of the money. It's entitled to interest in the usual way. And Unicredit are sought to resist paying interest on the basis of Section 44 <coughs> of SAMLA. And in simple terms, Section 44 of SAMLA uh, protects a party from liability where it acts in the reasonable belief that what it's doing is in compliance with the sanctions regulations. So the gist of Unicredit's argument was it had a, an erroneous, but nevertheless a reasonable belief that UK sanctions stopped it from paying, and it said that in those circumstances, Section 44 of SAMLA gave it a shield, which meant that my client couldn't claim uh, interest against it. And Celestial argued, in a nutshell, that the scope of the protection <coughs> under Section 44 was to protect the, uh, as it were, innocent but mistaken party uh, from adverse consequences. And adverse consequences is, the, is I think, the language used in the, in the uh, guidance to Section 44. And we said that if it were not required to pay interest, the net result would be that Unicredit would have gained a windfall benefit since it would have enjoyed the time value of the money for the intervening nine months, and it would be under no corresponding liability uh, to pay interest. So that's the flavour of the arguments that were canvassed. There were also arguments, I think, one of the more ambitious arguments put forward by Unicredit to the effect that Section 44 uh, meant it didn't need to pay our costs, and indeed we should pay its costs. Um, but in the end, the judge didn't uh, need to engage with what I think are actually quite interesting and difficult uh, analysis over the scope of Section 44 because it, uh, the court held that on the facts, Unicredit did not have a reasonable belief that the UK sanctions applied. And the subtext of the decision was that um, Unicredit was using sanctions arguments as a way to delaying payment and it, and, it, and it lacked a reasonable belief. So on that basis, the Section 44 door wasn't even opened at all. And that means that the very interesting and difficult questions as to the scope of the protection under Section 44 uh, remain at large and to be answered for another day. Save, save for the fact, of course, that um, Christopher Hancock held just that Unicredit had the relevant subjective belief rather than the reasonable point. It, so, it, it, so, exactly. so they got the door a little bit open, it, but then indeed. it got slammed shut again. It, exactly, yes. But exactly. you would say it's very fact-dependent. 
Yeah, so as you say, in order to engage Section 44, you need to have a reasonable belief, and as you say, <coughs> that obviously involves both the subjective element, i.e. did you actually believe it, yeah. and then the <clears throat> objective question, was your belief a reasonable one? And uh, the, the deputy judge are held by a whisker that they did, did have believe a belief. Only uh, just, doesn't Just it? about. Yes, he, just he, about. He said only just, um, but he said <coughs> that the belief was nevertheless not a reasonable one. Indeed. Okay, okay thank you very much, Fred. Um, uh, we're running a bit behind time, uh, not, for the, not for the first time. Barristers haven't been able to keep to a time estimate. But we started late. Yeah, we, we did. Uh, there's always an excuse for not <laughs> keeping to a time estimate, isn't there, Fergus? Yes, obviously. But I'm sure we, we've, got, we've got time for a few pithy questions, if anybody would like to ask us anything in relation to the matters that have been uh, discussed on this panel. Yeah. Um, Fred, in your case, was there sort of factual evidence and debate and cross-examination about how realistic it was to pay, was it $46 million in cash? Uh, it, it, it's a very good point. The, the, the answer is there was none at all. So the, the, the idea of paying in cash was, as I said, <coughs> This Libyan bank case back in 1989, and actually, I think uh, on a, on, since then, if you think of money laundering regulations, all that kind of thing, a lot has happened. Um, and you know, in fact, it wasn't paid in cash; there was, there was, it was, it was all paid, in fact, in sterling in the end. So it was, it, it, it was a, it was a theoretical argument put forward. But I think, Dave, as you say. Uh, there is a mismatch between theoretically what the judge is saying uh, is a feasible means of discharging the payment obligation versus asking whether that is actually realistic to achieve on the ground. And uh, uh, I, I think I certainly share the surprise, perhaps implicit in your question, that paying $46 million in cash is, uh, is, is, is any uh, easy feat. Are the defendants seeking permission to appeal or not? Uh, not yet. Not at least. yet. No. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, there's one, one at the back. back. <clears throat> uh, I understand that Germany also issued a license. And I was wondering how come there was no discussion about the EU sanctioned position? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, there, there, there was, uh, all, it, it, it was, it was mainly about UK sanctions and US sanctions, that, 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 that put plenty on our plate. Um, there was also uh, a suggestion that EU sanctions prevented payment, um, but luckily it was accepted, it was common ground that stood or fell with the UK sanctions position. So EU sanctions was technically an issue, uh, I think on the basis you say that, that Unicredit was um, a German bank and therefore um, EU sanctions were engaged, but no separate issue of those in relation to EU sanctions, because everyone accepted that was, for all intents and purposes, the same as the UK sanctions analysis. Any more? No, thank God, settled. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much for your patience, and uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, panel three now.
Okay, uh, we are going to take this at pace, so please bear with us, and I promise <coughs> there is food and drink to follow. Um, so we will try and crack through as many issues as possible. I'm really delighted that Freya Page, Head of Guidance and Enforcement at OFSI, is with us. Uh, Freya's been at OFSI since it was set up, uh, which is brilliant, and Jonathan David and David Heaton are both very experienced, brilliant commercial practitioners in chambers in sanctions and other areas. Um, starting with Freya. Oh, that's okay, it's just my phone. <laughs> um, one of the most common complaints among sanctions practitioners, it won't surprise you to hear, is that they've written to OFSI for a license or to ask a question, and six months go by and they hear nothing. And when they hear back, it's a series of questions from OFSI. Now, obviously, you've been flooded um, after Russia sanctions, and you have staffed up considerably. So I just wondered, are things improving on that front? And um, have you considered a sort of US-style OFAC telephone hotline or triage service for more urgent questions or something of that nature? Sure. No, it's a really good question, Maya. And certainly, uh, since the Russia invasion, uh, we have really struggled with the, sort of the, the um, intensity of the applications that we've received into OFSI. Um, we have, as you said, addressed that by putting some significant additional resource into OFSI. We've gone from around 44 uh, full-time staff to around, I think, nearly 140, I think we're at at the moment, uh, which is a huge increase, particularly in such a short space of time as well. Um, but a lot of that has got, gone into our caseworkers, uh, into our casework areas to help address this backlog. Um, we recognise that this is a huge, frustrating issue, um, and it's definitely felt on our quarters as well. Um, we are looking to get through that, and that it is definitely going, going down. Um, I think as well, I think the use of, of having general licence as well, um, I think since the start of the Russia invasion, we've definitely been a lot more creative in how we use general licences to address broader problems, to try and reduce that impact on specific licences. Um, so we hope that has gone some way to helping um, at least um, address that. Um, we did, some of you may know already, we had a, had a phone line, a helpline in place um, up until and slightly into the invasion. Um, it did become very chaotic at the time. We didn't have the resources we have now. We still operate that helpline. Um, it's not manned, in, as in somebody will call and somebody will answer. Um, but there is a voicemail service available. So if people do want to, to use that phone line, leave a voicemail, you will get a phone call back, you will get an email back, that will be addressed. Uh, but it's another way of people uh, being able to raise some queries and some issues to off -sea, that if we can't get back to, um, if it comes into the inbox, at least it's another way of trying to expedite those, those issues and get, get hold of us. And what I know off -sea does very helpfully answer questions in industry groups. Uh, like UK finance and other bodies. And I wondered whether there was any prospect of answers to questions in those fora finding their way into answers to FAQs or guidance or something of that nature. Absolutely. Um, we know that obviously being at those UK finance forums and having the ability to communicate some of these, these responses to industry is absolutely vital to ensure that we can still uh, take that feedback and respond to issues. Uh, but these are quite obviously closed groups, so where we can, we do try and take those questions and put those into our published guidance and products. Uh, you may have seen we've had several updates to our Russia sectoral guidance since the invasion, and a lot of that has been to add FAQs into our Russia sectoral guidance document. Um, FAQs is a very difficult one for government. Um, uh, my FCDO colleagues may, may um, agree with this as well. The government does not like FAQs uh, in terms of what we can put out. We're supposed to ensure that our guidance is sufficiently clear um, and provides enough background and context to enable people to understand the issues and we can talk about those in, in sort of fuller detail. So where we can, we do uh, try and put some FAQs in our Russia guidance because we, we understand how uh, difficult uh, Russia sanctions have been and the complexities behind them. So uh, we have gone some way to try and bring those into that forum. Um, yeah, to try and try and provide that that uh, extra advice for you all. Okay, um, Jonathan, I think it was very useful to hear from Paul about the kind of issues most commonly coming across his desk. Uh, obviously, you've had hundreds of different bits of advice, but what are you finding it crops up and concerns you most frequently? Right. Um, thanks, Maya. There. There are a few issues that 
tend to crop up. Crop up. Um, recently, um, one common issue is strict liability and, and how you address the risks arising with that. Uh, another one is, is how general licenses operate, in particular the legal services license. Starting with strict liability, uh, the introduction of strict liability uh, last June for sanctions breaches has generated quite a lot of nervousness under client, you know, among clients and their advisors. Uh, it's quite common for clients to come and say, well, we've got this transaction. Um, the other side, it, it's Russian or it, it's somehow linked to Russia. We've done all the due diligence we can. We don't think that it's subject to sanctions, uh, but we can't be 100% sure. And just taking an example um, that I've seen, you've got a counterparty, the CEO is, is not a designated person, but he's known to have close link to a designated person, um, but there's no other indication that he's actually controlled by the designated or he's acting on a designated person's instructions. Um, or another one, you've got a party has received a significant loan from a company associated with a designated person, the loan terms, they look, they look above board, um, they don't seem to give a designated person control, but there's still an undercurrent of doubt there. So it doesn't re rise to a level where really you've got, you can say, yes, sanctions are engaged, or even though I've got a reasonable suspicion sanctions are engaged, but there's still a level of doubt that particularly legal advisors are often very uncomfortable with. Um, and th those situations are actually quite common, uh, at least in my practice, and they can give rise to some uh, very difficult calls, and, and one of the reasons they're difficult um, is that, in my experience, Offsea doesn't like engaging in situations where you actually have reached for view where there probably isn't a sanctions breach here. Um, in general, you know, we've tried saying to Offsea, you know, we don't think there's a sanctions breach, do you agree? Offsea generally says, sorry, we can't help you there, make up your own minds. Um, we've, we've, tried, <laughs> we've tried saying, well, can we have a license just in case there's a sanctions breach? And obviously generally comes back and says, no, we can't give you a license unless you actually think there's a problem. And so you're in a sign of difficult situation, which if you thought there was a problem, you could get a license and everything would be fine. But because you don't think there's a problem, you're still exposed to a risk. Um, now, what, what I tend to advise in that kind of situation is, well, be as transparent as you can, tell obviously what you're doing, tell them why you don't think it engages sanctions, um, give them an opportunity to respond and object um, if they think there might be a problem. Uh, and the reason I say that is because Offsea's guidance um, on how it goes about imposing penalties is very big on transparency and, and engagement. Um, but that said, we've never had any response to any of those letters <laughs> from Offsea. <laughs> so we have no idea if that's because they actually think everything's fine or because they go straight in the bin. Um, so I would actually be quite interested to hear from, from Freya as, as to how um, Offsea views such correspondence. Right, so sorry to put you on the spot. But, okay. um, I mean, is that right? That, I think that is a common experience that, uh, on one on which perhaps Opsi slightly changed its practice, but in my experience also doesn't like giving negative assurances, as it were, and it also doesn't like, for the avoidance of doubt, license. we don't think there's a breach, but there might be, and if there is, could we have a license just to be sure? And it does seem a bit odd that sanctioned parties can apply for licenses for their own transactions, but non-sanctioned parties then who can't be 100% sure can't get any comfort. So if you could comment on what Jonathan said. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I will address the first point to the elephant in the room. We don't put anything in the bin. <laughs> I can assure you. Um, it's absolutely fine. So we do look at everything. I think in, you're absolutely right. We, we can't provide letters of comfort. We cannot give assurances. And I think... It's also really important to remember that within Offsea, we don't have a sort of a crystal ball or a, a system that allows us any more access to information uh, than you do. Uh, we have the same um, sort of you know, exposure to, to uh, sort of open source information, um, and we have to make our assessments based on that. But sorry, so, just pausing there, when you could do that. There's no, why, why can't you give a negative, you know, so, form of view, even though you don't have perfect information? So we can do that against, for example, a, a, a licence application. So you said you can't make a licence application if the application is asking, is this okay or not? That's not that's nothing that we can do. However, if your licence application is seeking, for example, a licence and you can justify it to say, this is why I believe this licence is in place, 
if OSI then reviews that and is unable to find a licensing ground under the derogation that you're applying for, then it will come back and say we were not able to be able but to. But what, what, what if it's unclear whether there's a breach? We're so unable to do that. So if, if there's a, a larger issue, such as we have, as you've commented before, Maya, that we have made you know, determinations before in very specific instances where that has been of a larger scale in terms of economic impact to the UK, where there are greater issues that we can actually refer up to ministers to be able to ensure that we're able to give that information, but we cannot do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Freya, can I ask, is that a policy decision by government and obviously not to do that, or is that something that you see as required by the sanctions <coughs> regimes themselves? It's a policy decision in government that we cannot do that, and that goes across, that's not just for OFSI, but other colleagues as well across government. We won't, you know, FCGO colleagues, um, DBT colleagues, we cannot give specifics on any individual case. That would be akin to giving legal advice, and we cannot put ourselves in that place, particularly as OFSI, where we are an enforcer. We cannot blur those lines in between. We cannot give advice and then find that we then have to take action or there might be action and it, and it creates a, a whole host of issues. Um, there is something there, I think, in terms of ensuring that we have th the framework in place to have these open conversations where these issues are fed back to us. Because by ha if there are issues with particular designations uh, or complications down the line, that's when we might think, OK, we need to have a further conversation with our FCDO colleagues about particular sanctions policy. Is there a specific need potentially for a general licence that might need to unblock a particular issue, especially if it's not just a problem that you're seeing, but actually many of you might be seeing? We can then take that away and say, OK, we need to do something about this. This is an unintended consequence or a particular unforeseen issue uh, that has not arisen within our government sort of decision-making process. We can then seek to address that in a, through a different route. I was just wondering, have, have you given any consideration to a sort of safe harbour regime like there is in respect of money laundering? where you can make a notification um, and get some protection um, against being penalised for entering in the transaction um, if within a certain time the regulator doesn't come back and say, no, don't do it. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, uh, really good example, similar to how we used to have in Iran, the notification authorisation yeah. uh, regime, I suppose. But yeah, absolutely, it's something to think about. Um, of course, that's more for um, FCGO colleagues who obviously d design the, sort of the sanctions policy rather than <laughs> implementation. I don't want to be one of those speakers of course, that says pass, passes it on. <laughs> uh, but that, that does take us slightly outside of, of Office's remit, unfortunately. But, uh, but it's a good idea. I mean, something else I know Jonathan's done quite a lot of work on is where is the, the meaning and scope of a general licence? Yeah. Uh, um, and we also wondered, and then Jonathan, perhaps you might comment, if, so a lot of people in this room have experienced not knowing whether something is covered by a general licence. General licence, for everyone who doesn't know, is where whole classes of transaction or situation are authorised, but sometimes they're quite hard to interpret. So if it's not clear, how should people get clarity on what falls within a general licence? Because again, there's uh, some response six months later isn't going to Absolutely. work for commercial parties. And definitely those responses are something that we're looking to get better at and to get much swifter at. Um, so we're hoping that uh, there's maybe not, not many outstanding responses with, with us at the moment. Um, but we do try and provide as much um, information as possible when we do publish a general licence. We publish the general licence on our gov.uk page as well as a publication notice, which hopefully gives a bit more context and reasoning behind uh, the, 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 the imposition of, the, of that general licence. Um, you may have seen that with the re recent uh, legal services general licence, we also posted a blog on gov.uk to help again give a bit more context and explain the changes and the slight updates that we had with that renewed legal services uh, general licence. But I would say as well, if it's a case of clarifying general licences, please do write in to us, use forums such as the UK Finance Sanctions Panels, uh, the Legal uh, Service Forum that has been set up recently to, to enable OFSI and, and, and the legal sector to have those open conversations. Please do feed it back to us. We will get back to you. It's in our interest to make sure that these general licences work for you. Um, otherwise, it gives us a headache, so we want it to be right. Um, so please do feed it back. Okay. Do you want... I just say, on, 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 on the Legal Services General Licence, um, and one of the sort of little bugbears we have as a commercial court practitioner is the monetary limits, which is, you know, five <laughs> <laughs> so, for, so for those who don't know, the Legal Services General Licence allows you to, to give legal services to a designated person and receive payment without a specific licence, but only if the total cost of the services 
that is under £500,000. And it's, it's not that the licence ceases to apply when you reach the cap. The licence doesn't apply if you think your total legal services are going to exceed £500,000. And in pretty much any commercial or chancery division trial, that's going to be the case. So I was wondering if there's obviously given any thought to increasing that limit to a level where you don't have to apply for a specific licence for every court case. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's something that we can definitely take into consideration. Obviously, we've just updated the recent legal services general licence, um, but as with everything, it's constantly under review. If we find that, um, you know, in multiple cases, it's not enough and there needs to be something more done to improve that general licence and how it applies and how it can help support uh, business, then we can certainly take that under review. Okay, just before uh, David comes in, on the enforcement front, um, OFSI has now pretty extensive civil fining powers, including on a strict liability basis, as Jonathan said, but there have been very few public fining decisions. Contrast the US, which imposes pretty eye-watering public fines and public settlement decisions, including sort of lessons to be learned, particularly as against foreign non-US companies, is that something that OFSI would like to replicate? Is that the direction of travel? Are we likely to see more of that here? Um, I don't think OFSI's ever really set out to, to try and replicate OFAC. I think it's very easy to draw comparisons between the two because um, we are very similar in terms of our position and how we sort of implement those financial sanctions and obviously additionally enforce them and with our uh, civil monetary powers, but I don't think that we ever have the appetite, and certainly when, um, I mean, I can say this because I was part of the team that sort of uh, started off, see, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but when, um, when we started having the powers for, to impose civil monetary penalties, it was never um, the intention that we would start dishing out fines left, right and centre, and that we would be imposing sort of dozens of them every year. It was always about maybe a handful of fines per year, um, not that we were giving ourselves a, a, a limit at all, there is definitely not a target <coughs> we're trying to reach, but we would envisage maybe a handful of fines a year that would be for those cases that were particularly egregious, where the regime harm actually could be evident, and there was willful negligence or intent, and there were real reasons behind that um, that would give us cause for concern. Because the main purpose when we do any enforcement activity is to publicise it and to talk about it and to advertise it, because that's how you can learn lessons. And it's not about giving the eye-watering fines to scare people and to frighten people and, that, you know, to be this overarching sort of, um, you know, body that makes everyone sort of qu quiver and shake in their boots. It's about ensuring that we come together, learn lessons and that we educate and that's how we get and improve our compliance. But so far there have been a handful and they're relatively small. So is it, are you saying that going forward they're likely to be the really egregious cases or...? It will depend. It will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we're definitely not afraid to put some high-level fines in. Uh, we have had a couple um, in the past. Um, they have been a lot lower, but then again, we haven't had the power for as long as OFAC has. Um, our enforcement investigations take a long time to come to fruition, so we're not always able to dish them out you know, on a regular basis. Um, when powers come into play, we then have to, you know, it, it only takes effect for cases that, and incidents that occurred after that came into play. So it kind of limits our timeline a little bit. I think as we go through the next sort of five years, I think more cases definitely will come to fruition and you'll start to see probably an increase in that. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, obviously is still, still a baby. You know, we, we're still just, you know, maybe a toddler finding our feet. Um, we definitely um, have upskilled, as I mentioned before, with our resource. And we, we take this very seriously. Um, but it's about making sure that in every case that is, it is appropriate and proportionate to take that action. Okay. Um, thank you. David, um, strict liability has certain quirks, uh, which uh, you're going to comment on, please. Yes, so um, as I'm sure many people here know, OFSI in 2017 received powers to impose civil penalties. So it can, without proving to the criminal standard a breach, uh, still impose effectively a fine for a breach of the sanctions legislation. But quite interestingly, last year, a provision was put through that said, that changed and broadened that power. It said that any requirement imposed by or under that legislation, so the sanctions legislation, therefore all the regulations we deal with day to day, 
Uh, so any requirement for the person to have known, suspected, or believed any matter is to be ignored for the purposes of imposing a civil penalty. It obviously quite significantly broadens the potential application of civil penalties. The regulations themselves, though, haven't necessarily been amended, and so that gives rise to sometimes some difficulties. Where you have a fairly clear provision, like thou shalt not make funds available knowing that one is so making them available, it's reasonably clear what falls away. Where those provisions kind of combine a mental element and a factual thing that is not perhaps so clear cut, it becomes a bit trickier. So, for example, the, the prohibition on making economic resources available involves making them available to a designated person, knowing or having reasonable cause to suspect that a person is making them so available, and knowing or having reasonable cause to suspect that the designated person would be likely to exchange the economic resources for or use them in exchange for funds, goods or services. So the, the tricky question that arises is that final element being framed as it is in terms of what somebody has to know, suspect or believe, does that just fall away altogether now for the purposes of civil penalties? Or is it the case that that has to be, there must be, as it were, objective facts that establish that likelihood, and that likelihood has to be there, but you don't have to show anybody knew or were, had reasonable grounds to suspect that the person was likely to use the economic resources? Um, I think that is quite a difficult question. Uh, on, on one view, the clear intention of Parliament was that penalties should be imposed in much broader circumstances than had been the case. Um, on another view, what's happening when those penalties are imposed is effectively a compulsory extraction by government. Where things are uncertain, therefore, you should construe them effectively in favour of the, the person who's potentially being penalised. So uh, I find that quite difficult, applying that new provision to some of the sanctions regimes. And I, I wanted to ask Freya whether Officey has kind of any house view on the answer to that question. Um, so on strict liability, when that all came in, it's ultimately it enables us to be able to take more action and to be a little bit more forthright with our enforcement, um, going a little bit back to that previous question that I asked in terms of how we can um, you know, do more akin to OFAC. It kind of allows us to be able to, uh, to take further decisions and to take action where previously we were slightly more restricted to do so. Um, but really importantly, it, it's important to remember that when, it, when strict liability came in, we, I remember we wrote a, a blog about it on our gov.uk page, and to say that this wasn't going to drastically change Officer's approach to enforcement. Um, we were not looking at uh, suddenly bringing in a whole host of cases that were previously not under scope, and we were going to bring them in and start taking action. Um, it was very, about, very much about still to take, taking that proportionate approach. Um, and we would still take into consideration all those mitigating and aggra aggravating factors. We would still look um, at timely self-disclosure. Ultimately, we want people to come to us. Um, we, we do that in all of our cases so far that you know, we have both enforced and not just through monetary penalties. We obviously have a whole suite of other tools as well, namely the administrative um, warning letters, uh, and we do those very frequently. Um, but still, we're looking at those, you know, how did, how did you, you tell us? Did you come to us? very quickly, as soon as you were aware of that. Um, how much information did you do in terms of your due diligence when you found out or leading up to that? Uh, what was the regime harm and those sort of things. So those factors are, haven't gone anywhere. We're still taking those into account. Uh, we're not looking at suddenly rewriting the rule book in terms of how we look at our enforcement. Uh, and certainly our monetary penalty and enforcement guidance hasn't changed that much considering with strict liability. Yes, the powers are there, we've had to insert them in but it doesn't mean that the rest of that process changes. And what about David's point that when you read the regulations, you can't tell which bits the mental element has been removed from? So no one, you, when you now read the Russia regulations, they don't say, they don't mean what they say because of the way strict liability came in. Yeah, I mean, certainly we can look at, at clarifying that and making things clear if that's something that, that, would, that would be helpful. So uh, maybe we can chat afterwards, Jonathan, about um, how we could, how we look to do that. Um, another thing we wanted to ask you about was ownership and control. Just a brief um, comment, Jonathan, from 
Do you want to say anything arising out of the last panel about? Um, well, briefly, um, I'm not going to engage with particular, particular points Fergus um, okay. putting on me, but, but one, one, one point, it, it was, it was, I think it was suggested that, well, there are these two elements of ownership control, and one is very simple, which is, are you owned? And the other one is, or, or, or controlled in a legal sense, the other one is, is much harder. Um, namely, this, you know, can you in most cases reasonably expect that the desk that uh, a company would act in accordance with designated person's wishes. Uh, I actually don't agree that the first element is particularly simple, um, it would be my, my point. Um, certainly, as, as I've said, if it's the counterparty who you're worried about, it can be very hard to have visibility over who owns and controls them. But even if you are a company um, trying to look into your own ownership and control, it can be quite hard to figure out what's going on. Um, <laughs> And that's especially the case where you've got ownership di divided amongst different designated per people. You're trying to, are there arrangements in place by which different shareholders are, are, are acting uh, together? That's not something which has to be disclosed to a company necessarily, especially if it's not a listed company. So from a factual perspective, you're often a company sitting there saying, well, it's, it's actually quite hard to tell. Are we, are we owned and controlled by a designated person? We know there's Somewhere up, somewhere up in the ownership structure, someone's designated. Um. And uh, so, Freya, I wanted to ask this. So, on a number of occasions, I've seen it that different legal advisors have taken different views on whether a company is owned or controlled by a designated individual. And I know because I've been in panels that obviously have formed a view about whether a particular company is owned or controlled, but it hasn't made that public. And often designations are not made listing companies, even where obviously have taken the view that a company is controlled by a sanctioned individual. That doesn't seem particularly satisfactory. So what should advisors do where views differ on whether a company is actually subject to sanctions? Yeah, it's a really tricky question. Um, there's so much information out there and people will form their own assessments. And I think ultimately the difficulty with ownership and control is a, it's a point in time assessment. Um, it could change from one day to the next, from one month to the next, from one hour to the next. It's very difficult to, to ensure that if two people, two different companies are looking at this, to ensure that you come to the, arrive at the same uh, conclusion. But could um, it be, I mean, it's the government that's imposing the sanctions, so shouldn't yeah. it be the government making the assessment about who is subject to sanctions? So absolutely, in terms of when we make that designation criteria, that goes back to, to, the, to the Foreign Office, who will make those, that those determinations and understanding. Um, but again, we don't always have all that information. Some of that may take time to, to come to fruition, and that might need to be reassessed by government to see if there's anybody else that should be in scope or should be designated. Um, and those, those considerations can be made if they're raised to us and we start to see uh, you know, an, an issue or a pattern with that. Ultimately, from OFSI's perspective, uh, we understand that no one's always going to make that same assessment. Um, people will come out with different things, access to different information through different you know, um, intelligence providers um, will make a difference. When assessing any su suspected or potential breaches that involve ownership and control, the important thing for OFSI is that we see and we understand that there has been sufficient working out. Um, so almost like doing your maths homework at school and you had to kind of work it all out in your sort of book. We, we need to see that you have taken those steps and that you, you have that thought process and you have tried to sort of, you know, sort of look into all the sort of nooks and crannies as part of that investigation. If we can see that at least, you know, the attempt has been there, that you've really tried, even if you come to a different conclusion, yes, it might be the wrong one, but we can take that into account when assessing that breach and actually consider that this person has actually done all that we could expect a person to do. You know, that's all, that's all there for us to see. Okay, just final question and then... We'll briefly open it up and then have some drinks. Um, circumvention is another topic that I think is very difficult to advise on. Um, David, I mean, what, what is the boundary? It seems to me if you're complying with sanctions by structuring your affairs so that sanctions are not breached, when are you circumventing sanctions? Because that's an offence, potentially criminal offence, that is not licensable and, and, again, a tricky one to advise on. Uh, tricky indeed. <laughs> uh, what, what does circumvention mean? Um, 
I, I mean, it, it, I think it is extremely difficult to say. There's really, as, as you know, Maya, from having appeared in it, there's one case really that deals with the topic in the Court of Appeal, a case called R&R. &R. It's particularly helpful. There's a judgment of Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, a separate and quite differently reasoned judgment of Lord Justice Briggs, as he then was, and a separate concurring judgment of Lord Justice Ryder, who agrees with both. So knowing <laughs> what the position is, I find extraordinarily difficult as a matter of <coughs> law. I think what you say, Maya, is so as a rule of thumb, um, I think if you are doing things differently for a sanctions reason, and it's only because of those things you are doing differently that you don't technically breach a primary prohibition, practically speaking, it seems to me that there's a risk there, and that's something to watch for. Um, in terms of the, the legal analysis, if you like, I find Lord Justice Briggs, I think, the clearest. He sort of says, well, if it's within the purpose of the regulation to prohibit what you're doing, but you've arranged things so that you don't technically breach, that seems like circumvention. If it's not within the purpose of the regulation to prohibit what you're doing, and in that case, it was a Russian person paying money to somebody else in Russia, to which the EU sanctions didn't apply, um, then it's just a lawful means to a lawful end, and it's fine. I think that's certainly the clearest reasoning. Whether or not it's right remains to be seen. And I mean, would obviously that this is why I think more fining or settlement decisions people would find helpful because it might indicate where obviously thinks that what circumvention means. So either perhaps guidance or some examples. Is that sort of on the agenda? That's a, yeah, absolutely. We can definitely look into doing that. Um, I think. Certainly, I, I would agree with David, I think, there. When, when, you, when you have to structure your affairs or you have to put things in place to allow the structuring of affairs for a specific reason that would otherwise uh, cause you to, to circumvent the prohibitions, then you're looking at circumvention, even if how you do it ends up being legit. <laughs> <laughs> technically, technically isn't. Um, and, and, I, and I completely um, get the point about, you know, obviously you can't, you know, license these things. It can be very, very, very tricky. Um, but I think, you know, if you were to um, undertake a transaction without rearranging your affairs, knowing that there were sanctions in place, and there was a legitimate business reason to do so, come to us, come to offices, cite the derogation, give your reasons, set it all out, set out the grounds. Um, and if it's something that we can license and allow, then we can. I'm sorry, if, but uh, why, so what's the reason, because you can't, as I understand it, get a license for a circumvention offence? Not for circumvention offence, but, but why not? Before that would take place. So, if you were to undertake activity uh, before that would, um, before we're looking at circumvention, um, but if after the refusal of the licence you then had to change your affairs and restructure it, you would then be looking at you know, raising flags to us about what, what activity was going on there. So, if so, because there are some situations I've addressed where it seems to me reasonably clear that you're not breaching one of the primary prohibitions, maybe because you don't have reasonable grounds to suspect something, but you might be worried that something does amount to a circumvention. And I, I, don't, I just don't myself understand why the regulations are drafted in a way that doesn't allow you to seek a licence in that situation where you reach a view that there is a breach, but it's a breach of the circumvention prohibition. It doesn't seem to me any more inherently sort of abhorrent to license a circumvention and to license a breach of the primary contravention. So is there sort of a policy, or what, if anything, is the policy rationale for that? So that would definitely, I hate to say this, be a question more for FCDO oh, in terms of drafted it, but we can definitely maybe um, at, at drinks a little bit afterwards ha have, a, have a chat about that. But that there would definitely be something there in terms of the actual drafting of the regulations that we need to look into to allow uh, that to be opened up and looked at. I, I think that would be potentially very helpful. Mm. Would, would um, just I hear thin air. So if it if it was a breach of UK sanctions, say to pay forty six million dollars by bank transfer, would it be circumvention to pay that in cash instead? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, there will be obviously lots of time in the evening for questions, but one or two, if anyone would like to ask one publicly, before we head downstairs. Yeah. Okay, lots. Two over here. Well, welcome to the greater transparency and the idea you can give a voicemail. Suppose somebody wants to meet you and come along and explain their client's position. Are you happy to engage with that sort of openness? 
So on and without prejudice basis. No, <laughs> we do have an engagement team, and we and we do we are happy to sort of take feedback and things as well. So if there's definitely a good reason for us to do so, and we have the capacity and we're able to, uh, then we we are happy to have conversations uh, with individuals. So yeah, do, do do please drop us an email, and we can look to uh, take that up. There. Um, back in March, uh, Baroness Penn made a written ministerial statement that said that Offsea was now taking a presumption not to grant special licenses for defamation and other cases, and the general license now has a prohibition on similar uh, situation. I was just wondering whether Offsea are planning to provide any guidance um, what, to what that presumption means, what are other similar cases, um, and importantly, what's the scope? Is it claims, or does it include letter before action, pre and post publication correspondence with media public media publishers? That's a really good question. We haven't planned on putting any guidance out on it, uh, but if that's something that would be found useful, um, then maybe we can chat afterwards, and we can definitely look to um, get something in place. That'd be yeah, very interested in that. Thank you for raising it. Okay. Could you uh, expand a little bit on the, the, what you said earlier about the, not, the, the reason for not having FAQs, particularly in, in circumstances where the EU, both the EU and OFAC do FAQs, and also against the back <coughs> of the uh, backlog of, of inquiries and questions, would not FAQs be a good thing? Very good point. Um, so the, so the, the anti-FAQs thing is more of an HMG. Um, sort of perspective on how all government departments should align their guidance to make it accessible for everybody. Um, and they very much view that FAQs are not um, always necessarily helpful. Uh, but then again, we do look at the likes of OFAC who have FAQs, um, but they have over a thousand, which is just an incredible amount of FAQs. And from a from my position in terms of sort of head of guidance in, in OFSI, when we look at maintaining and updating and ensuring that they are accessible and that people can actually, you know, uh, navigate their way through those FAQs, they're actually very burdensome. So we did break the rules with the Russia uh, sectoral guidance because we did understand that there were some very complex questions and they were coming in so fast that actually the best way to communicate that was just to go ahead. Um, and get the slap on our wrists, but to go out there and do it anyway because it was so important to do so. Um, we do try and update those, and if there's reason to put more in, we absolutely will. Um, but at the moment, we do try and ensure that in instead of adding to an infinite amount of FAQs across all regimes and for all issues, actually we can keep those quite sort of, you know, focused around Russia, but actually in other areas improve guidance and ensure that actually within that material we are providing answers that hopefully have more context. Um, and are much you know, better explained than just, just doing um, sort of bullet FAQs. Okay, thank you so much, Freya. Um, I'm just going to ask Lord Sumption to close proceedings, but thank you all very, very much for being here, and we will see you downstairs. It remains only. the government panellists, uh, since um, answering questions for which you have administrative responsibility <laughs> is much more difficult than answering questions as a barrister for which you have actually no responsibility for that correctness <laughs> at all. Um, uh, and I think, though, that um, all of us will agree with the questioner of a few minutes ago uh, who uh, uh, observed that the willingness of uh, civil servants to engage with the public, often on very difficult issues, uh, is one of the most, uh, um, uh, ha one of the happiest developments in the in government practice uh, over the last 20 or 25 years. So special thanks to them, but also to all of you for coming here and for asking uh, provocative uh, and uh, intelligent questions. <laughs>